I'm Theo Meder. I'm a folk narrative researcher at the Mertens Institute and at the University of Groningen. And um, my co-convener uh, is Ava Gorcic um, from the Estonian Literary Museum. Um, she's probably now um, busy with her baby. She's on uh, maternal leave, so you can see that she's online, but she is not uh, participating at the moment. She will be returning soon. Um, and uh, early in the program, there was uh, another uh, presenter uh, called Maria Acuna, but she withdrew and uh, she will not be presenting. That means we still have two panels today, and this is the morning session with four presentations. Um, and in between, there will be a poster presentation of the working group of archives. But now we're dealing with the theme of this panel, and that's archives, access, ethnics, and fraud. Well, probably we skip fraud because that was the subject of one of uh, the keynote speakers uh, in 2020, but he uh, went to another panel uh, in this CF conference. So uh, the theme is how should traditional and especially digital archives deal with matters of access and ethics? What can be put online for free? How to deal with copyright and privacy and what to do with controversial material? Okay, all the sessions uh, will be recorded for later uh, viewing again. And this morning, like I said, we have four presentations of about 25 minutes each, uh, including uh, a little uh, discussion. But in the afternoon, we have more time for discussion anyway, because then mm -hmm. we only have three presentations. Okay. Now, going over to the first presentation is first speakers are Sonia Vespera Dalmeida and Rita Cachado, if I'm pronouncing Perfect. that right. Yeah. <laughs> Both from the University of Lisbon, uh, Portugal. So it's an hour even earlier <laughs> for them than for us, for <laughs> Central Europeans. And they're going to talk about new laws and new ethics, uh, Portuguese anthropology and ethnology, uh, ethnographic uh, archives. Uh, and it's much about um, uh, ethical rules for ethnographic archives, controversial data, embargoes, um, researchers' independent decisions, and suggestions for the near future. Well, I've said enough, and it's now time for, uh, for Sonia and Rita to start. And I believe Rita starts first. Mm -hmm. um, the screen is yours, uh, Rita. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Theo. I'll, I'll share and then we'll begin our talk. Uh, we changed a little bit uh, our abstract, so maybe there, um, we won't approach everything you said, but still. Um, let's put it bigger. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Yes, okay, so we'll begin. So good morning. We are very pleased to be here in this panel and wishfully contribute to the debate. So thank you all, especially to Theo Meder for organizing this panel and for being so kind during all the process. Uh, in this presentation, we will introduce a work that inspire us for our discussion. Then we present the current status in Portugal considering ethnographic data. After that, we will speak about rules and guidelines and how they are known or unknown by researchers. And before the final remarks, we will give some examples about how can we deal with those regulations in a way that we can preserve our data safely for our interlocutors and for ourselves. Um, so to go straight to the point, uh, we selected Edward Simpson's article titled Is Anthropology Legal, Earthquakes, Blitzkrieg and Ethical Futures? Where briefly, he warns anthropologists about the fact that we don't have 
permanent education on ethical rules by telling us about his experience. He has done an ethnographic account about how religion, religious and state institutions responded to a big earthquake in Gujarat 2002. Uh, among his readers were some of the institutions represented in his work. They didn't like it. Uh, they took him to court. Uh, and this article is a reflection on the reasons why this might happen. There's a lot of authors, but we really like this article. On the one hand, he argues that there is a need to develop more robust mechanisms for explaining, explaining and defending what the discipline is, what it does, and why this matters. But on the other hand, if the guidelines were followed loyally, he says, it would be difficult to conduct any research at all. So, say Simpson, and we agree, a good way to resolve this situation is to include specific training in our all courses. Uh, we will return to these questions later. Now I pass the word to, to Sonia. So, uh, uh, now, uh, to continue our argument, it's important to question how anthropological data is produced and how anthropologists build data concerning the ethical structures of the discipline. As uh, Simpson pointed, the discipline practice has changed. Uh, global structures and locations of power have changed since the coming modern anthropology. Anthropological knowledge is no longer our exclusive possession. Anthropology, anthropology has new terrains and modes of engagement as well as new publics and audiences. And finally, those who inform anthropology are often now in a position to read what is written about them. So, however, uh, we continue to turn people into writing, but also into sounds and images, and each individual anthropologist has their own way of recording, recording ethnography and their own system for saving records in the archives, more or less organized. The primary data gathered is the result of the specific relation between the researcher and interlocutors, which is characterized by both commitment, co-responsibility, and mutuality, as Pina Cabral and Portuguese anthropologist suggests, and therefore uh, need to be preserved. According to these anthropologists, mutuality emerges as a methodological preoccupation in discussions about fieldwork ethics, referring the way in which anthropologists and informants are engaged in processes of co-responsibility. Uh, Pina Carvaral also points that ethnography is an activity that is centrally dependent on intersubjectivity. So, mutuality, co-responsibility, and intersubjectivity, how are they expressed in the archive constructed by anthropologists? Should the ethnographic archive be an object of negotiation with our interlocutors? In what ways? So we argue that the archive should be ethical construct and its sharing should be thought and problematized not only within the framework of the specificities of the construction of anthropological knowledge, but also in the context of the relation that the anthropologists establish with uh, the interlocutors. This, this is why we cannot hide from this discussion the dynamics of ethical uh, selection, ethical selection that are present in the construction of the archive. Ethical commitment implies dealing with complexity, uh, with tonalities and textures of our experiences, and anthropologists and interlocutors, and with the uncertainty and even ambiguity. For example, in the framework of my PhD research about the, one of the main initiatives carried during the Carnation Revolution, I interview, among the others, the Prime Minister of the time who passed away in 2005. At the time of the interview, the agreement I made with him was to use the audio record of the interview for the thesis and from the papers arising from it. For example, I will never use for an exhibition or other type of ethnographical, anthropological uh, product, um, I will never use it, so, uh, except uh, with the express permission of his descendants. So we ask, if anthropologists intend to prepare their materials for archiving, informed consent, consent should address this issue? How is data archiving handled in the discipline's codes of ethics? 
We have consulted some, some codes, and this question is not detailed, uh, and it does not seem to be central, a central concern by the major professional associations. Perhaps this is because the debate, even international, needs consolidation. However, ASA ethical guidelines include both archiving related to confidentiality and related to anonymity. The code uh, uh, in this slide is an example uh, of the principle that regulates rights to confidentiality and anonymity. Uh, in Portugal, uh, the ethical concerns about, uh, the, about the archiving anthropological field still need discussion and further consolidation. And the most anthropologists are guided by a set of international ethical, uh, international uh, ethical codes. Um, as Lambeck argues, ethics in anthropology is not a consensual territory. There is a tension between, uh, between positions that invoke the need to establish normative guidelines and rigid codes, and, on the contrary, positions that tend to avoid, avoid this rigidity uh, and opting for an ordinary ethics. However, however, as Rita will address, uh, this new European legislation has brought uh, uh, a new awareness of data protection and some concerns to anthropology practitioners and institutions that teach and research in this disciplinary uh, area. So, uh, Rita, it's your turn again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, as you know, there are rules coming from the European Union that require sharing data produced by European projects. And for those doing uh, qualitative research, as we do, uh, to include informed consents for each interlocutor. These rules include the responsibility concerning data. In Portugal, an increasing number of universities are asking their researchers and students to submit forms to ethics committees, sometimes very difficult to fulfill, uh, especially when one doesn't have specific skills. In our point of view, this situation implies that we respond firmly to the challenge of providing training and to increase the debate that stresses these rules. Uh, so there is literature, of course, there are rules, but in Portugal we still don't have a general ethical guideline document for all anthropologists, but we are trying to deal with such new rules. One of them concerns the need to have, as we said, an informed, uh, written informed consent, which is something that somehow uh, might jeopardize mutuality and ethnographic relations based on trust and confidence. So currently, the use of an informed consent depends on the interlocutors we are dealing with. One possibility is, of course, using audio informed consent. Uh, Sonia will now share her experience with students. Yeah, uh, in the early 90s, uh, we can identify the concern about student uh, education in Silverman at Barezo that organized a conference entitled Preserving the Anthropological Record Issues and Strategies, among, that, uh, among other things, highlight the importance of training in several ways. One of the main objects was to develop strategies for helping the archival com community better comprehend the problems relating to anthropological records, namely practitioners, students, and local populations. So I teach ethnographic methods since two, two, 2009, and uh, during uh, the graduation course, along with reflection on ethnographic gesture, mutuality, ethics, I work with students on the archiving of ethnographic materials coupled with ethical dilemmas. Ethics and construction of ethnographic uh, archives are learned in their strong uh, relationship. So, students carry out an ethnographic research exercise for one semester and are challenged to construct a code of ethics based on existing codes or, if they do not agree with this type of regulation, present a reflection on their position in the field, their relationship with their interlocutors and how they uh, dealt with informed consent, consent and privacy. Since the UA uh, legislation, undergraduate and master students have shown a growing concern about the formalization of informed consent and demonstrate some disquiet about the lack of regulation of specific norms in Portuguese contexts. Perhaps, for this reason, during the ethnographic exercise, they opt to build a code of ethics instead of only a brief reflection. So, to sum up, um, there is the need to maintain, endorse, uh, and improve courses about ethics for ethnographic research. 
we should keep up with rules in an open and critical perspective, understand the needs uh, from uh, the archives, and finally, sharing our practices among teachers and researchers. So, thank you. Uh, here we have some references. And finally, our emails. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for this wonderful presentation that is really in the center of, uh, of our attention uh, at the moment and uh, very well uh, fitting uh, the theme of this panel. Um, and you've been uh, staying well within the time too. Um, so there is some room for discussion, uh, questions, remarks. If Should I wants interrupt? To Yes, you can interrupt the, the, the sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone having a question or remark? Um, you may do that in chat as well, if you like. I think uh, Susan, uh, Susan Osterlen, Lund. <laughs> have something to say. Sorry to not pronounce your name. Uh, yes, Susan. Susan is good. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yes. uh, thank you very much, Rita and Sonia. This is such important things that you, you bring up and excellent starting presentation, I think, for, for this session. And I, um, I, had, I had a question because I think um, I, I work at an archives and um, uh, in, in Helsinki, a tradition archives. And uh, one of the things that is uh, a bit problematic with, uh, now we also have this consent forms, of course, for collecting material. And that's all very, very well with the material that we collect. But mm -hmm. one of the problems is always that there's so much amazing material that researchers collect that we can't accept because mm -hmm. they haven't used our specific mm -hmm. forms. So I was wondering if uh, from, from your side, if there are archives that you're working with, if they have their own forms and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. how, how we could sort of solve this question, because I think it's such a shame that, that our materials that researchers would be willing to donate, but we can't accept it because yeah. that little... Uh, Sonia, can I say something? Yes, 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 okay. yes. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a, an answer. We have, uh, well, Sonia has more experience with archives uh, in itself. Nevertheless, I guess there is another question to put uh, to your question, uh, because uh, uh, do anthropologists before wanting to deliver their materials, do they select, do they have a profound reflection on what to share and what not to share? So I guess for uh, for the archives, it's very difficult to deal with a big amount, but if first we have this big reflection, then the materials will be narrowed before going to, to the archive. Of course, I, I, I think all my pictures are very important for <laughs> anthropology, but I should select them considering ethical uh, codes and considering my own ethical issues, uh, for instance. Let's yeah, uh, so, and uh, and uh, we can um, uh, question also uh, if there is an uh, hierarchy in our archives. So for us, it's mm. uh, more uh, um, I, I don't say simple, but there is uh, mm. not uh, not it is not a problem um, if we share. Uh, imagine uh, images, photographs, and uh, but the, the other materials that that Susan uh, uh, pointed. Sometimes they are they are uh, more uh, more um, they, they 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 raise more 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 problems. So uh, I think the the question that Pat Kaplan's uh, uh, in our in an in an article in two thousand. 10, I think, okay. uh, mm -hmm. 10, um, uh, she argues that informed consent should be put no, and should be questioned uh, uh, with our interlocutors. I don't know, maybe it's uh, mm -hmm. a way to not to solve, but to to put the, commu the anthropological community, interlocutors, uh, archivists, anthropologists to think about uh, these, these, these questions that, but as Rita said, we don't have one answer because it's so important to, to be here and discuss it with all of all yeah. of you. 
I don't any know other, if we're responding. Okay. Any other questions and remarks? How about um, historical material? Um, if the archive has material from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and there wasn't a questionnaire on, uh, do you uh, are you okay with uh, us publishing or um, um, what do you do with the, with this material and material from 50 years ago? Uh, yeah, like Gildia's archive, I guess, Sonia, I don't know. Gildia's archives is a, a, an archive of a colleague that passed away, and um, with the, 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 the consent of the, 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 the descendants, uh, uh, that archive is in Krias in, in, in a, in a uh, research center. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, 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 we have legislation, uh, government legislation about uh, historical archives, okay, in Portugal. Uh, and I think this 25 years we can, uh, uh, it, we can uh, uh, research on, on, on those materials. Um, but uh, uh, for me, as an individual researcher, it is very difficult <laughs> to share or to put in archive uh, or in a digital archive to uh, uh, to, 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 to think about those uh, the type of format that we're dealing with um, uh, because I didn't uh, uh, negotiate uh, this, this share, that sharing with my interlocutors so uh, I can ask them again if they are alive but uh, for me uh, the, main, the main question is to uh, ask uh, uh, their, uh, their, their descendants so as Susan pointed out uh, okay we have lots of material that will be in the shadow, uh, uh, maybe uh, maintain in the shadow if you want. Um, but uh, for me, uh, I'm because I I'm very uh, I can, uh, Rita, can I say uh, purista? I'm very. Um, um, I don't know in a way. No, in a way. <laughs> classical or a very, um, very classic uh, point of view, if you want, uh, 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 related uh, to these these materials, because because in the relation, in the mutuality relation, in the cross responsibility relation, uh, I didn't ask uh, to use that materials in, in that in yeah. that way. Um, mm -hmm. Is that um, because of this in my uh, teaching courses, I I, I try to to uh, problematize with the students those questions: uh, ethical, okay, informed consent, priva pri uh, privacy, anonymity related uh, with okay. the archives. Definitely. So, uh, and there's there's I don't I don't know is this the better way, but I think uh, uh, um, is uh, one one possible um, at at the moment. I think. Okay, thank you. Are there more remarks, questions? If not, then we'll be moving on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sonia and Rita. Thank you. This thank was you. a very, very good start of the morning. Thank you. Um, and the next next speaker will be Nicholas Huden. Uh, I, again, hope that I pronounced that right. Um, from the University of Turku in Finland, and his presentation, uh, yeah, an excellent start of the morning, I agree with Kelly, yeah, uh, to deal with um, collected materials in time, different approaches and cryptic state issues, and he will be speaking uh, if I understood that right, uh, about how rules and regulations can make research, for instance, into smuggling more and more difficult. I would say, um, Nicholas, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I can say that I am working at the Obo Academy University in Turku. There are two universities in okay. the city. I'm so sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not very much. I'm working on an archive there. But I could maybe share my screen here to see. Yeah, you should be able to do that. Okay. Yeah. Do you have it? Yeah to deal with collected materials in time. Mm. Yes, this is merely a sort of 
short reflection about uh, dealing with material that has been collected during time where we have different opinions of what the material is and can be used to. So it's the same questions as in the last excellent paper we heard, but this is more loosely laid back reflection about the same things, I would say. So to say, we have, of course, in the, I present, present the university and its archives a little in here. There are many archives in the Old Academy University, of course, and they are of different kinds. There are zoological and botanic and geological museums and collections that are used in the, in the education in an educational way all the time, of course. And this, of course, is why we have collections from the beginning in the... I'm working at the cultural, now called Cultural Sciences Archive Cultura, and we have collections from, from say, the 1800s, at least, something of course even from the from the 18th century of course and we are using them also in our education and to let the students sort of collect their own material for research in a way uh, I would say that the collections are quite big. Nowadays we have about 80,000 fo photographs. The questionnaire activity started in 1952, but we have older materials as well. And uh, there are some 15,000 answers to these questionnaires, which are spanning in a very big way from from the earlier uh, questionnaires probably mostly were regarding the agrarian way of living in Finland that way but nowadays it's more like the 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 vernacular life of people in the whole of Finland there is some special special specialization on the Finland Swedish people who talk Swedish in Finland along the west coast and south coast, but especially the questionnaires in our archive collect material from the whole of Finland and in both Finnish and Swedish. So that's something that we have had from the beginning. But on the whole, the material spans from 18th century, late 18th century, no, late 19th century to the present in that way, as we had. The thing I'm going to talk about today is missing material that should be in the archives but is not and i'm concentrating mainly on on some illegal activities that probably were quite common in the whole coastal finland at least in some way this church only illustrates one of the main concepts that I will go into shortly. We have them here. The whole paper started in about 9, 20, 2017 when I got a request from the Helsinki University that 
could we sort of get to some material about about beach combing which is of course looting of shipwrecks and so on that was supposedly quite common in the coastal areas of finland and coastal areas everywhere of course and i answered that we don't really have any material about that some mentions are, are probably present but it's very meager results when you search for it in Herne. and the researcher who was planning a, a seminar about this uh, said but that should be your speciality in that area and you have material from all these coastal areas in the archipelago and so on and why, why don't you have any material about this and uh, and maybe you could come and help make a paper about why do you don't have it and i said i don't know why we don't have it but here i am now keeping a paper about this thing there are many reasons for this but i think it mostly is depending on some kind of politeness or considerations from the archival point of view that you shouldn't really write about or collect illegal things in a way and this is the situation you could say from from the earliest questionnaires into this time when there are some more uh, uh, tries to to address this matter but i will concentrate on this of beach combing or wrecking as it used and then the contraband or smuggling which is the other issue that everybody knows that it was very common especially during the pro prohibition law in finland from 1918 19, 19, to 1932 and during this time researchers from our university were already doing field work in this area and they rarely mention anything about the contraband activity and smuggling of spirits mainly from europe and estonia and so on into that we have sort of say almost nothing in our archives but i'm beginning with the beach combing and this is the church from runo in estonia an island which had swedish speaking population until the second world war and this is the old church that exhibits as a decoration on its wall a uh, stern from a probably 18th century ship that has been put as decoration on that and this is the church it's the most official building in the whole island and of course the priest had had to sanction this thing and it illustrates that the beach combing wasn't necessarily seen as illegal although it from the state point was illegal you should always report and give the material back to the crown or the state in a way that we have so it in a way it, it was illegal but in a way it was sanctioned by by everyone and it had some economic uh, uh, functions in the in the coastal communities in a way and we have some stories about priests and wickers that cut the sermon short because they heard news of a of a vessel that had shipwrecked somewhere and and they 
all went out to loot and wreck, gather the wreckings from the from the vessel in a way. These kind of stories are sometimes told also in in uh, our archival material, but it's always very sort of. They don't know exactly where it happened, and it was told that it was in this and that church, but nobody is sure about the thing. But it happened, they do say. And the commonness of, of this type of, uh, of uh, beach combing is also mentioned by early researchers. Here's a photograph from the Lerkholmen in the Nago archipelago from early 19th century. It's, as you see, it's really from Sweden, the, the, the photograph. The only reason I show it is that you see on the nearest building there, there's a small sign above the door of the building and that's a ship's name from a wrecked ship that has been put on and john guard barry who was making this his uh, master's thesis on the archipelago communities in southwestern finland said that these were very common until in the beginning of the of the 20th century and then they were sort of publicly considered macabre or gross in a way and they were put away somewhere probably some found their way to early local museums and so on but mostly they were not used anyway and that has to do with something with that the actual beach combing was more and more seen as something criminal and illegal in a way so we have mentions that if i go through all the material about beach combing in let's say these fifteen thousand questionnaire answers i get two answers that talk about beach combing in a way and the one is mentioning gathering in in a pub in Estonia and this where where they had sort of commercial interest selling fish and so on and then they talks about could be about shipwrecks and the working of, of things and a sort of laconic uh, saying that nobody got rich on such activities, but the, it was in the blood of the people. And uh, even more neutral is the second one that said that they're, they're used to wreck goods on the ice and in the drifting ice. And that has been practiced into our times. This was written in 1969. In a way. So that's quite a meager thing about something that was common in all the societies along the coast coastline. And we can go into the evidence of contraband, which was even more practiced, especially under the prohibition law, as I said, and almost every house in the scariest had collections of mainly Estonian spirit bottles that were brought in. But when I look in our questionnaire material, they mainly say that, yeah, it was you sometimes brought home a bottle as medicine or something like that. But it wasn't that really that we didn't do it that much but then they always say that but in that other village there was one person who did it professionally and so on 
And usually it's very anonymous. Sometimes they they are so well known, these smugglers, that you can mention their names. Everybody knows it still, so it's not that dangerous. But probably no one answers yes that, that we did it a lot. We did smuggle spirits during that time. And if I go further in time, talking about nowadays from the same area, Estonia, probably a very big portion of the spirits that Finns drink comes from Estonia and in a legal way, in a way. But I can't remember if we ever have asked the questions in a questionnaire about how people buy their spirits in a sort of a politeness from our side, I think. And also a concern over that our informants maybe could be irritated by such questions in a way. And of course, nowadays it's, it's also more difficult to ask these kind of questions in a way. And just for curiosity, I did searches in our databases about other things that would seem hard to, okay, to have in a, in a questionnaire in a way, but all the others, other terms I have put here, the violence, rape, and even murder are much more plentiful in our uh, material. But there are some differences ac according to the time when they are recorded. And often things are used as metaphorically in a way. So you have to look at each mention or to get into the meaning of it. For instance, rape is quite often used in questions about nature and so on, that we are raping the nature and the way we way. Violence, of course, there are the questionnaires about the wartime and so on, so it comes in, in that thing. And looking at murder, almost half of the mention of murders are are considering the murdering of Kennedy or Olof Palme that people have found something to remember in all times. So there are about 30 mentions of the murder of Kennedy in a questionnaire regarding the 60s, 1960s, in a way. And more recently, we have had questionnaires that ask question about family life or women's experience and so on. And there you can also find, find mentions of rape and so on. And in the earliest material, songs and so on, you can even find the words uh, rape in a more sort of humoristic sense that that are in those early songs not uh, amusing nowadays in a way but you know it was used in poetry in those times Coming back to our own times, in the 1990s, we had some research projects with, especially in interviewing people from the archipelago, tried to ask questions just about the contraband thing and the smuggling times. But uh, already then, I think we ha have had so, uh, these uh, forms for interviewees to sign since 1999, 
but only already before that the, it was quite common that the researcher sort of promised that no one else than the researcher will see this material anywhere so we have about the something like 20 interviews about contraband from from the 1990s which we can't use because they are regulated that nobody can see the material except the researcher who is no longer with us so to say and that's a problem of course and we have other materials also that has these kind of restrictions i don't know how to deal with it yet in a way and i would also say that when we make questionnaires it's all some thing in the back of head of the archivist that's always are a little re re reluctant to ask questions about things that might be considered illegal and so on and that has of course been even more difficult now that we have the all all the ethical considerations that we have to, to sort of consider all the time away so sometimes i think that in the early material these mentioning the illegal activities were so to say there was some kind of consensus between the researcher and the informants about uh, the, we don't talk about these things all everybody knows that this is common and uh, all the thing but we will not ask you questions about it that's a possibility but i haven't seen any mention of um, any researcher saying this it's sort of very remotely only said that yes well, well there was something of that and maybe we still have a little problem with this politeness in a way but it could also be considered maybe to belong to the thing that was called ethnological niceness in a way the ethnologiska trevligheten in swedish that still sort of bothers us as archivists and researchers in a way and how we are to deal with this if you have to go to all the ethical committees and ask presentations it will probably probably result in that the material will be very restricted in a way and that's maybe has to be considered a bad thing i don't know yes that was my speech or paper thank you very much but i will gladly answer questions if you have any see how Stop. yeah thank you very much uh nicholas um are there uh, any questions or remarks yes rita uh okay thank you i i found it very very interesting and uh, uh i would like to go there and know more about that archive um in the beginning of your presentation you was you you said that people uh, are asking for these materials um mm. and i wonder if you if you know uh who who are these people common people anthropologists um and what are their objectives uh, why do they want these materials and or what for if you know mm. and then uh, um, uh, about the when the research, as you said, the, one of the researchers is not uh, with us anymore. Uh, 
uh, passed away. Um, so when that kind of uh, situation happens, what do you think about asking for responsibility uh, of his or her research center? Uh, meaning that maybe they have uh, the reflection already done and maybe they can have uh, better answers for you. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, the people asking for the material in, in the first case I was telling about, it was a researcher for, from Helsinki University who, who was planning a seminar about this. And I think he had a seminar in 2018 about it. I wasn't on the thing in a way. So that was probably a way of problematizing, problematic ties the same thing that I'm talking about today. One other case, there are plenty, but one other case that I remember especially was a, a older amateur researcher who was writing a book about smuggling in a way, and he asked for all the material we have. And I gave the one, the ones that we could show to him and said that's nothing and then he published a book on about 200 pages with interview with, with lots of people who had no problems naming or saying that they his father was doing this and i was with him as a boy and so on so sometimes the official face of an archive is too official to give consent to to this kind of material but when a friendly person are, are interviewing you and saying I'm, I'm writing a book about this you can get the book and so on then it's no problems for people so that's something that archives have to face all the time and what was the other question <laughs> I don't want to monopolize, so if there is uh, other questions, then I will ask later to Nicholas. You, you, go, you can go ahead. There is some, uh, somebody, uh, Barbara will ask a question uh, later on, but you can. Uh, okay, so like. to, to rephrase, uh, you, you, you said that uh, one of the researchers involved in the archive, uh, he's not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if the, the, the research center where he or uh, she uh, took part can say something about what to do with some materials. Uh, well, that's one of the earliest uh, uh, sort of forms used for this kind of thing that we don't allow people to make these kind of promises anymore. And this special material, we are still discussing what, what, what to do with it, in a way. And uh, the person was in a research project that doesn't exist anymore. But maybe one, one could ask of pe people from that project that what do they think? Could we use that material? I haven't even looked at the material myself. I don't just know how many interviews there are in that case. But we have other, inter especially interviews that have the same restriction that only the interviewer person can use the material. But as I said, we don't allow that anymore in those forms. Okay, well, next question or remark is for Barbro. Thank you very much, and thank you for both presentations. I think I have got one remark and, and one rather banal question. And the remark is that um, we all know that archives were never comprehensive. There was all, always something lacking for reasons that we well, cannot sometimes can understand, sometimes can detect, and sometimes it's merely unintended consequences of the fact that our predecessors' interests, well, was directed in a, 
and went in some directions and not in others. What is so different now is that, um, among other things, uh, GDPR sort of presents us with with a manual for what is sensitive and therefore to be mm. hedged. And that is a huge problem. It's a huge problem outside the archives too. And I would like to add to, to Rita's presentation that uh, I work as a, at a public university in, in, in Sweden, and we are instructed that our field notes are public from the moment we scribble them down on a piece of paper. And moreover, we abide by the... Thank you for looking that way. It's reassuring <laughs> to me. Uh, and we are also instructed that we are not... If, if a person enters the university and asks to have a piece of public information handed over, we are not allowed to ask, why do you ask? What are you going to do with it? So for the moment, I find it very hard to conduct uh, the kind of research that I want to want to conduct. Um, so this is sort of the backdrop for my my question to Nicholas. Uh, what is the status of your archive? If a person enters at, at your desk and says, I, "I want that collection," can you deny access, and for what reasons? No, it's very loosely mentioned that we are using it for research. And if, if we have the consent for that, um, almost anybody can see the material if they come to the archive and look. But we don't put it on the internet or something mm -hmm. like that. But still, we have some kind of standing. Uh, promise from the ethical committee at the Obe Academy University at that as long as we do as we always have done, we can make questionnaires without really asking a new permission. But that includes that we don't ask, say, very difficult questions about illegalities and so on. So I think if we would especially ask about people's love life or, or if they have done anything illegal in their time, we would need a special permission for that thing. But I don't think, I have heard from different places in Sweden that, that everything is public material that you have in the lab that you just said. And I don't think this is, situation is the same in Finland in a way. I don't know uh, in other archives, but for instance, own notes wouldn't be considered to be public material. But I'm not sure about that. Maybe Susanne or Ursa from would know more about that thing. Mm. There was a remark by uh, Irsa in the chat that uh, mm -hmm. the the privacy rules, the, the European privacy rules, don't apply to people who are dead. No, um, and um, it's more than an ethical question if you want to uh, uh, to share this information. Then uh, then it has anything to do with uh, privacy. That's the remark, Isra is placing here. Maybe she wants to add anything to that. No. Oh, the thing about dead people I learned about last year, <laughs> in a way. So that, that was a big relief, of course, mm -hmm. when you think of the historical material that we have, that it can be used. Yeah, just to make sure, um, does your archive have any material online or is it just a paper archive with questionnaires? The questionnaire answers are not online in any way. The, the actual questionnaire names and sort of teams are on the online. The interviews 
have uh, the names of the interviewer and the uh, subject online but nothing of the of uh, sort of the actual interview only the subject and the interview's <clears throat> name that's yeah no transcripts no okay thanks uh, nicholas um, um <clears throat> it's time for the next presentation and i see that Ava now came online with her little baby girl. <laughs> um, maybe you want to introduce the next speaker? Yes, good morning, everyone. Sorry I couldn't be here an hour ago. Um, I would like to introduce the next speaker, who is the mastermind behind all this panel, which should have been a conference in Amsterdam. And I'm very, very grateful to see you about taking on the most of the load of uh, being the convener and, and uh, running things here. So please, Theo, the screen is yours. Yes, thank you. And um, I must uh, make the first note that uh, what I am going to present is a pre-recorded presentation of 18 mi minutes. Uh, so you can sit back and relax. And I hope I am able to play this little video for you. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Let me see. Can you hear this? As a folklore researcher, I manage and coordinate three databases. One, the Dutch folktale database, the largest one. Two, the Sagejager or legend tracker. And three, Isabel, an international database, the intelligent search engine for belief legends. I will be mainly talking about the first one, the Dutch folktale database. However, let me start with a little example from the Sagejager or Legend Tracker. We manage a site with legend routes called the Sagejager or in English Legend Tracker where hikers and bikers can go from one folktale to another with their smartphone or tablet. People can read the story, listen to the story and then move on to the next legend again. Each story is accompanied by an illustration, usually taken from the internet. One story in the Haarlem route was about a beer privilege and had a photo of a few glasses of beer as an illustration. In May 2019 we received a letter from a Belgian agency called Permission Machine. The photo with the glasses of beer was licensed by stockfood.nl and we had to pay 318 euros for its use. We immediately replaced the photo with a copy that we did have copyright on and thanks to the Royal Academy's legal department we ended up getting away with a 150 euro fine. The agency Permission Machine has software running that constantly searches the internet for licensed but unpaid photos. Letters are sent every day with bills and fines. This is the agency's revenue model and it's perfectly legal. Two other sites with blogs from our institute were fined as well. As a result, two of my databases with illustrations, the Sagejager and the Volksverhalenbank, went black for a few months, so that we could replace all suspect images with either our own photos or illustrations from the Creative Commons domain. The Dutch Folktale database currently contains 48,000 folktales. Not all stories are accompanied by an illustration, but there were 2,640 pictures we had to check. Each image 
had to be assessed separately, press photos and licensed pictures had to be removed and substituted by Creative Commons illustrations. While in the process we immediately removed or made invisible all photos of narrating children just to be sure in connection with the new privacy rules. If you really need a copyrighted photo for your documentation, conceal the picture behind the password. The Dutch Folktale database has this option we can mark to acknowledge we don't have the rights. This means no one online can see the pictures, but people who have a password for the database can see them. 110 users of the Dutch Folktale database have a password and can see much more hidden information. Not only copyrighted pictures, but also private data as well as offensive material. The policy of the Meertens Institute and the Royal Academy is open access. This applies to articles, journals, books, databases and archive material. However, this open access is subject to all kinds of restrictions. Take the Liederenbank, the Dutch folk song database for example, which contains 175,000 lyrics, melodies and metadata from the Middle Ages until the 20th century. Of songs after about 1900 only the metadata are included, not the lyrics or melodies because then we quickly run into problems with copyright. The organization Buma Stemra watches over the rights of composers and songwriters and the amount to be paid in licenses is far too high for the Dutch folk song database. Similar restrictions apply to the folktale database. The database will always contain the full text because in principle there is no copyright on folk tales and everyone can do with it what he or she wants. In fact this is about collective heritage. In principle however every performance of a folk tale is the creative property of the performer. Therefore in modern stories in many cases permission must be requested to put the folk tales online. Folk tales such as modern legends and jokes also regularly appear in newspapers or magazines or their associated websites and sometimes they are accompanied by press photos. In such cases copyright is clearly involved and the material cannot be publicly reproduced. If possible, a link will be created to online articles and photos. Yet text and photo are regularly included in the database, but then invisible to the outside world. A password is required to view some texts or illustrations. Without a password, the stories and pictures cannot be found. There are various reasons for including information for research, but not making it visible. Through password protection, these can be the reasons for making stories and metadata invisible. 1. Copyright. 2. Privacy. 3. Offensive content. As mentioned, stories from newspapers and magazines as well as press photos are always protected for copyright reasons. Only researchers with a password can read the text. And another item is protected, the Arne Thompson Uter catalogue, the types of international folktales. Author Hans-Jörg Uter and his publisher do not want the catalogue to be available online, because they want to be able to continue to sell the paper catalogue. Nevertheless, the catalogue is in the Dutch Folktale database, but again, only visible to users with a password. And the catalogue cannot be browsed. The corresponding information from the ATU catalogue can only be retrieved for each individual tale type. 
So with Little Red Riding Hood only the information about ATU 333 from the catalogue becomes visible. Since 2016 there is the European General Data Protection Regulation GDPR, that in our case can apply for metadata about collectors, metadata about storytellers and snapshots especially of children and even information about real life characters in a story. Some 30 years ago many information about collectors, storytellers and real life story characters was free accessible in the database. Safest and easiest option these days is to make sensitive data invisible, except for owners of a password, with only a few exceptions, like famous collectors who passed away over 70 years ago. In the past Students have been interviewed about jokes and modern legends. In Dutch we call them broodje aanvalen. Their folktales have subsequently been included in the database. At a certain point students apply for a job, become doctors or lawyers and when they google their own name they find their jokes and modern legends again because they now find those stories unfavorable for their image, we sometimes receive a request to remove the stories. Throwing it away would be a shame, but anonymizing and or placing it behind a password usually offers a solution. With the stricter privacy rules it has been decided to make all names of storytellers and collectors and their personal data invisible to the outside world. The information has not disappeared but it is only visible to researchers with a password. I give here another recent example I got emailed about. Someone found a story in the database and wrote to me in a nutshell. In your database I found a folktale about my grandfather and it is untrue. My grandfather was not an alcoholic and he didn't drink himself to death. For me and my family this story is hurtful. Please delete the story. I did not throw the story away but I marked the story non-public. So the person complaining cannot find it anymore. In short, the questions that should always be asked are 1. Do we have the rights? 2. Is privacy at stake? And the third question that has not been answered yet is 3. Is the material in any way extreme or offensive? Even though many people mainly think of fairy tales and legends when they think of folk tales, not all stories are equally sweet, friendly and nostalgic. The book of folklore, folk culture and folk tales has its black pages too. Modern jokes and contemporary legends in particular can be extreme or offensive. That means they can be racist, sexist, pornographic or extremely violent. In the past there was also a taboo on Lee's Majesté insulting the royal family, but this article has now disappeared from our legal code and is therefore no longer punishable. Nevertheless, caution is still warranted here too. Racist folktales include, for example, discriminatory or hurtful stories about Jews, Muslims or immigrants. Common racist jokes in the Netherlands have been made against Surinamese, Antillians, Turks, Moroccans and recently because of the corona pandemic, Asians, especially the Chinese. 
one meme is here as an example. It says the Chinese may have the tiniest dicks. They did screw the entire world. Marking such a meme as extreme will make it invisible again and unretrievable in the database, unless, as a researcher, you have a password. Sexist folktales denigrate women or discriminate against certain minority groups based on their gender or sexuality. Here's a meme about a dumb blonde and a banana peel. The blonde thinking, oh no, here I go again. Pornographic folktales are explicit in the field of sexuality and certain internet memes in particular can be visual very distinctly pornographic. Here's a recent meme dating from the Covid crisis again. They found him, the Chinese bat that fucked the world. Finally, violent folktales can, for example, incite violence against certain population groups or animals. The bonsai kittens serve as an example here. Please don't worry, this was an internet prank, a joke, and all the bonsai cats were photoshopped into the bottles. Insulting the royal family, especially the king and the queen, is no longer a crime in the Netherlands since 2020. Jokes, memes and urban legends about the royal family need no longer be hidden, but it still can't hurt to be a little cautious. Here is an example, kind of a wordplay on the name of the Queen. Here the Dutch Prime Minister Rutte says, ha ha ha, you screw Maxima? King Willem Alexander replies, he he he, and you screw the minimum wages, ha ha. Another question is if fake news and conspiracy theories are offensive or extreme too. Well, maybe they do sometimes, but most of the times they do not get hidden, but they get explicitly marked as joke or as modern legend. It is not wise not to collect such kind of stories, because that way one loses sight of the dark sides of storytelling. But it is wise not to put all these stories online for everyone to see. As an example of an extreme joke, or rather a riddle, we can look at the worst joke in the folktale database, which I have always kept a secret until now. A warning in advance, if you can't take a very rude and terrible and offensive joke, please stop listening and reading here, because you will probably be shocked. I thought I saw this joke on the internet first, in a submitted joke forum, with the reaction of someone else, haha, below. But I can no longer find this joke in the folktale database. Maybe I thought it was too bad to record at the time. But I may also remember this wrong. It must have been about 25 years ago. However, the joke also occurs in my colleague Gieselin de Kuiper's collection from 1995 and it was collected for a survey into ethnic humor. Therefore, it must be clearly understood as a joke. The literal English translation of the Dutch joke is How can you fuck a nigger kid between her tits? Kick between her tits there will be a groove automatically. Now this joke is bad in many senses. The joke is racist because it speaks of a black girl. It is sexist. The girl is represented as a sexual utensil. The joke is pornographic with extreme sex with a minor. And it is extremely violent at the same time. So this is the worst joke hidden in the Dutch folktale database. I am sorry to leave you with 
such a terrible joke. Uh, for over 25 years, I never have revealed this joke to anyone, not even under pressure. Now you know what the sickest Dutch joke around is, and I promise you I will keep this joke in hiding in the database forever. Okay, well, um, again, I'm sorry for this very, very rude and offensive joke. Uh, and it is, I didn't even recognize it really as a joke uh, because it's not funny at all. Um, but still, well, okay, um, that's it. And um, please have your remarks. Uh, thank you, Theo. I think it's, uh, it's really important actually to to point out the extremeness of folklore and how we, in fact, as researchers, can't uh, close our eyes to it. So it's really, uh, for us, it's walking on an edge. Uh, how do we publish it? If we publish it, how do we hide it? And how do we explain it? Because uh, at some point, someone will ask questions and, uh, and people don't like the answers necessarily. Uh, I see Tina has raised her hand, please. Thanks, Ava. Um, thanks so much for that presentation, Theo. I have a really quick just question of clarification and um, thinking about making things visible and hiding them. How do people qualify as a researcher? So in a lot of, um, I mean, we've heard this morning uh, undertakings, you know, only the researcher will have access to this or only for research access. And uh, I work with a community archive and uh, that, that's a sort of, um, it's an approach that is immediately problematic for us um, because we're community based. So I'm always very interested to see with different archives where the negotiation of the status of the researcher is or negotiation for access. Yeah, I, I can understand that. And um, um, the common users of the they, they all have to email me. They have to <laughs> request permission. And uh, in most cases, just ordinary users of the database don't get a password. It's only the people I know that are researchers in academia that are able. So mainly my own colleagues and uh, some of the students who work with me as interns and need to be able to see more information in the database. But it's really very limited to uh, academic researchers. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, that looks like it might be a topic that would be bear a lot of fruit for us to continue uh, sharing experiences on and, and discussing over the next few years as these issues come to the fore more and more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Thank you, Theo. It was a fascinating paper. So thank you very much. Maybe I just missed something, but my question is that uh, when you hide the record uh, from the public, uh, do you make um, um, just uh, like a keyword or a remark why it is hidden, like just like a tag? pornographic um, um, content or offensive content or everything is just under the same label? <clears throat> um, no, there are three different labels that I can tag. Um, uh, privacy, um, uh, copyright and extreme. The word is extreme. Is this an extreme uh, folktale? If it's tagged, then no one can see it, not even Google. I mean, not the, the web crawlers and, and search engines, they won't find it anymore. It's just vanished for everybody. Uh, so these are the three uh, main categories, yeah. And do you want to um, make it more, um, I mean, do you want to add more tags or, or you are happy with this tree? <laughs> are you happy with this tree? <laughs> For the moment, I'm happy with these three, 
uh, I must say there is a fourth option. Um, don't show this at all. Uh, so even uh, for some jokes that are terrible, I make a little summary and the summary isn't offensive and you can't see the text. But in some cases, I may just um, decide not to show it at all. So uh, it goes uh, non-public and then no one sees it. Yeah. But yeah. I you know, I, I totally understand this problem. Just, you know, in a point of view, I'm, I'm so sad that um, people from the public um, um, in the future, they, they won't see that how many pornographic Dutch folk tales <laughs> do you have, for example. So maybe just a pornographic tag, you know, will be useful or... Oh, okay. Okay, I but see. Just yeah, a suggestion. No, yeah. yeah the, the point is, if you uh, have a password, you are able to uh, to search for extreme. So you can search for this uh, certain tag, but then you get everything. You get um, holo uh, Holocaust jokes uh, along with pornographic jokes about Saddam Hussein or something like that. So yeah, well, maybe I want to. Uh, distinguish these categories. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Um, your presentation actually just reminded me uh, of uh, a few scandals that our archive has been in. Well, one was not a scandal, but in the uh, Stalinist era, our archive was heavily uh, what's the English word now, sorry. Uh, well, it was checked very heavily and certain uh, type of folklore was banned or crossed out. Uh, in addition to, of course, certain names that were banned, like Oscar Loritz. Uh, but uh, in um, recent years, some, some years ago, and maybe it was 10 years ago, uh, we had a very public uh, scandal in Estonia involving certain publications uh, on uh, racist jokes, which for us, like, is uh, it's just it's folklore. But then uh, there was uh, there were people who pointed out that uh, these texts are also used in school books, and the word nigger is not uh, proper anymore. So the, the archive was, uh, and then some other colleagues uh, from our um, neighboring uh, department, Department of Folkloristics was uh, dragged into a very public scandal. So my question actually is, do you have to face some kind of a backlash because of the material uh, that you have in the database, uh, or is it so well hidden that people just don't uh, figure out uh, that there could be something very sensitive there? I mean, you had one uh, example of this uh, family story. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that happened more often, so it made me uh, decide to hide more stories. Um, the morals are changing uh, here as well. So, for instance, on my own accord, I decided to um, uh, to hide racist jokes about Moroccans and Turks, uh, not because they asked for it, <laughs> but because I thought they were no proper uh, material anymore. But in the past, I, for instance, got uh, um, emails from Jewish people who opposed to certain uh, jokes about Jews in the past. So then already, let's say some five or ten years ago, I started to uh, select more stories as offensive. Uh, in the beginning, when I started my database in 1994, nothing was taboo. <laughs> uh, you could put anything online uh, without any thought, uh, but things have really changed. And uh, we, we should, as an institute as well, be very careful and cautious with what we put online. And I... Probably I will get some emails in the future as well about um, uh, hurtful uh, subjects uh, too. So uh, I haven't seen the last uh, of, of these uh, uh, emails yet. Yeah, very likely. Also, Sonne, one last question, please. 
Yes, a very short question. I, I was um, uh, wondering about this password system. So if a researcher has received the password, for how long is that valid? I mean, if that researcher has applied for a, a particular study, but then can they use it for, for everything after that? Or is it sort of limited in some way? No, it's not limited uh, unless I want to. I can kick them off uh, any moment I'd like to. Uh, but um, so far, I have no reason for um, uh, uh, taking back uh, the, the privileges to look into the database. Uh, some uh, probably don't just don't use the password anymore, uh, but some still do. Uh, again, if I want, if uh, as soon as I think um, you're not um, uh, entitled anymore to this uh, privilege, then I can take it away. But um, generally speaking, uh, the password will stay uh, as long as uh, people don't. Uh, misuse it. Uh, but okay. do, you have, do you have some kind of a general rule? I know we're over time, but just a quick question. Do you have a, a general rule how often you change these passwords, say like in every three years or five years, or, or you don't bother yourself with that? They, no, these are, well, they don't get a password from me. They have to, uh, to uh, think of their own password and they don't have to change it okay. uh, in a few years. But maybe I should uh, introduce this rule as well. Ah, okay. We need, we need to go on uh, for- Yes, uh, exactly. Thank you, Theo. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give the floor to you again. Thank you. Um, Next uh, speakers uh, who uh, uh, actually were first on the program, but I didn't realize that it is two hours earlier than Central European uh, summertime uh, in Iceland. Uh, but now the next two speakers are Rosa Thorstein's daughter and Trausti Daxon, uh, from both from the Arnie Magnussen Institute for Icelandic Stu Studies in Reykjavik. And they will be talking about a continuity of the narrative tradition. And it mainly uh, um, is about two uh, folktale, Icelandic folktale databases, Sakna Grunur and Ismus. And I'd like to say, um, Rosa or Trausti, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. We are here, both of us. Are you Hello. together on one stream? We should share our screen now. It's good to have a technician. <laughs> Mm. Mm. <laughs> So, like this. I'm, I'm sorry for this, but uh, you, we will take uh, take a U-turn and not talk about what not to uh, have accessible, but how to get more things access accessible. So, uh, as Theo said, I, I work at the Folk Archive of the Árni Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies as an archivist. It's not a large archive, but for many years, the aim has been to make it accessible online to everyone interested and in a number of ways. In order to do that, the archive joined hands with the Museum of Music here in Iceland to make the database ISMUS, which stands for Icelandic Music and Cultural Heritage or something like that. It is a database that preserves and makes a 
accessible material that concerns Icelandic culture in the past and today, audio files, photographs, film, manuscripts and texts. In practice, the project falls into three parts, though each part uses the same framework so that certain information is shared, for example, about people, places and poetry. The three parts are concerned respectively with music in manuscripts, musicians, Icelandic musicians through time, and last but not least, the collection of audio recordings preserved for the most part in the folklore archive. Access to all of the data is via the website where one can learn about Icelandic music from all times and listen to people communicate learned and descriptive material tell stories and recite poetry. The story of East Moose as a project goes back to 1995 when Bjarki Sveinbjörn, currently the director of the Museum of Music, began to put together photographs of manuscripts containing music for publication on the internet. At around the same time, work also began on the digital cataloging of the Árni Magnusson Institute's folklore collection since, under the auspice of the Institute, a large amount of material had been recorded on tape. In the latter half of the last century, collectors had traveled widely around the country, visited farms, talked to people and recorded all kinds of material. Both legends and wonder tales, descriptions of beliefs and customs, poems, hymns, nursery rhymes, epic poetry and much more variously spoken or sung. Folklore material had thus been collected in all parts of the country and also in the Icelandic settlements in North America. The oldest sound recordings in the collection are folk songs with, which were recorded on wax cylinders in 1903 through 1912. The Institute's folklore archive is thus an extremely rich resource documenting aspects of Icelandic life and culture in previous times. A great proportion of the informants were born before or around the turn of the century in 1900. The oldest was born in 1827. But the collecting of folklore material never ends and the collection is constantly expanding every year for example, students of folklore studies at the University of Iceland add material about contemporary culture in the form of interviews conducted as part of their studies. In addition to this, the Institute itself still actively collects new material. The archive now includes over 10,000 recordings of oral folk tales, both legends and wonder tales, and for example, do we count ourselves very lucky that the collection contains late 20th century recordings of people telling various types of wonder tales while still in living tradition. The East News database also has over 10,000 persons named and around 5,500 place names. But let us now turn to folk tales preserved in printed sources. The work on Sagnagrunnur started in 1999 and was led by Professor Terry Gunnell at the University of Iceland. The main objective was to create a searchable database of all legends in published Icelandic folklore collections. The project built on the earlier archival work of the Arten Magnusson Institute. And you could say that the creation of an index of keywords that could be used for both the sound archive and a database of folk legends in print was a crucial step in the process. Sagnagrunnur currently includes over 10,000 legends taken from 21 printed collections. These collections vary greatly in size and were collected in different time periods. The largest, largest collection is Islenskar Thjóðsjóru Einkiri, uh, Icelandic Legends and Wonder Tales, edited by Jón Árnason in the 19th century, with between two and three thousand legends. 
The total number of persons named in the database is over 3,000 and over 7,000 place names are mentioned, of which more than 4,000 have been connected to GPS coordinates, enabling them to be shown on a map. <clears throat> over the last few years, the database has grown, making it more than just a database of legends. In 2016, a further database of World Wonder Tales, found in print, was integrated into the Sagnagrunder. This new database was created by Aðalheiður Guðmundsdóttir, Professor of Medieval Icelandic Literature at the University of Iceland, and includes metadata on 554 wonder tales, many of which come from the same sources as the, as the legends and are told by the same storytellers or by people closely related to many of those people already mentioned in Sagnagrunnur. While work on Sagnagrunnur had been proceeding, other developments had been taking place in Iceland. Two closely related projects were coming into being. The first one, led by Karl Aspelun and Terry Gunnell, provided an extensive context for the creation of Icelandic cultural identity in the latter part of the 19th century. A project which had the collection of Icelandic folk tales as one of its key ingredients, along with the design of a national costume, the establishment of a national museum, and the creation of a national drama. The latter project aimed to place more focus on one particular aspect of this moment, movement. Tracing the international context and the collection and publication process of Islenskar Fjölsögur og Eventyri, edited by Jón Arnarsson. Spanning over seven years, these two projects have involved the digitization, transcription and annotation of a significant number of original documents archived and stored at different Icelandic and international institutions. In both cases, the aim was to put all these materials on the one digital roof, make them openly accessible and searchable, and link to existing digital resources both in Iceland and abroad. An important aspect of these projects, like that of Sagnagrunnur, is that rather than planning for them to exist and work in isolation, there has from the start, been a strong emphasis on the idea of interconnection with other projects at home and abroad, working closely with the key Icelandic cultural heritage institutions and, and building on previous knowledge, including technical expertise. Which bring me to Treste. <coughs> yes, um, I will be talking here about the development of a new version of ISMUS that will hopefully be open for the public this coming fall. And this new version will replace the current one that is now accessible on the website ismus.is. <coughs> <coughs> the current version of ISMUS holds vast information on folklore, music, places and persons. The folklore part centers around the audio recordings, which are linked to persons as interviewers and, uh, and informants and places of recordings. The music part takes on the history of music in Iceland and includes, for example, data about church instruments, songs in books and manuscripts, musicians, bands and musical events. And this means that the whole database is quite comprehensive, but can be confusing for users only interested in one field, music or folklore. So for the development of the new version, we wanted to keep the connection between these two parts that I am de defining. Actually, Rosa was talking about three parts, but it's a, it's a matter of definition. <laughs> but with the possibility of certain distance between these two parts, music and folklore. The front page of the new version is therefore split into music and folklore with notable links to specific sections related to either part and links to sections that are related to both parts of the database. The folklore part of the new version was greatly expanded with the inclusion of these two databases mentioned by Rosa, Sagna Grunner, created by Professor Terry Gunnell about legends in printed folklore collections, and Ivy Tira Grunner, a database of printed want details created by Adelheider Guðmundsdóttir. 
The data from the two databases was added alongside existing data in eSmooth for overlapping data types such as person names, place names, and keywords. An attempt was made to automatically merge these data entities with rather good results. Persons and places that appeared in both databases were merged and ensured the correct links to other data were kept. And this created, in some cases, links between the audio collections and the Latin database, and therefore different periods of folklore collection. Uh, now we see on the screen the search form for audio recordings in the new version, and it is similar to the one on the current one. Users can ser search for recordings based on different types of metadata. That can be keywords, form of material appearing in the recording, type and motive index number, or location of recordings. Recordings can also be searched based on performed poems, meter of the poems, or types of performance. And finally, searched by names, genders, and locations of, of uh, informants and uh, interviewers is also possible. In the list of search results, the user can directly listen to its recording, and the audio player is fixed to the bottom of the web browser, so the user can continue browsing the website while listening to audio without the player disappearing. The main search sensing for the new version can be accessed from the site header. The search sensing is based on the full text engine elastic search, which means that it is fast and flexible. Results appear as the user types, and it is possible to filter by specific data types. <clears throat> this search is, however, quite generous, but each section offers more specific search if the user are focusing on special types of material. <clears throat> The audio collection includes a lot of folklore material that can be legends, wonder tales, or narratives about life in early 20th century Iceland. The inclusion of the two other databases of printed folklore material gave us the opportunity of a new approach to the new unified database. While it, it will still be possible to search only the audio collection, only Sagnagrunner, or the wonder tale database, we also present a new joint folklore search across our, all three databases. In this new search form, users can search by common metadata, such as keywords, type, and motive index numbers, which only applies to more details, specific information, uh, specific informants, or status, gender, and homes of informants. Search results appear under the form in tabs to easily switch between the audio and the printed material. <coughs> The list of keywords used in the creation of Sagnagrunner, as Rosa mentioned, originally came from the work for uh, early ISMUS, and the idea was always to be able to search for keywords across those two. <clears throat> A further interconnectivity between audio and printed material can also be, be seen in our experiments to find uh, so-called similar material. That feature is available when either viewing a single audio recording or a single item from a printed collection. The search sensing looks for other folklore entities with word distribution similar to the one we are currently viewing. This, of course, will in many cases produce a list of quite unrelated material, but has proven to be useful in other cases. For a test, we searched for, a word, for two words, Raven and Landslide, in the main search engine. And using its full text capability, the search engine will look for items containing those, those two words, which gives us three legends. By clicking on one of them, we will see that suggested similar items are few printed legends and few audio recordings. And by ta taking a better look, we see that they are indeed quite similar. They are all about someone who is generous to a raven and gives the bird some food. The raven then saves its benefactor by luring the person away from the farm shortly before it is hit, it is hit, hit by a landslide. And wonder tales in both audio recordings and, form, and from printed sources are also linked together via motive index numbers. And for each item linked to a motive, there is a list of other items, audio recordings, or tales with the same number. In the new database, it is also possible to manually link specific recordings to a legend or a wonder tale from a printed source. 
This is, for example, useful in cases where the printed source is actually a transcription of the recording. And an example can be seen here on the screen, uh, where in the interface it is possible to listen to the recording next to the summary of the tale. Wait a minute, you say um, here on the screen, but are you, are, you, uh, uh, are you sharing your screen? I thought I was sharing my screen. Uh, do the others see the, the screen? No, 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 we don't, we're not seeing uh, your PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I was uh, um, uh, under the impression that you would not do a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. <laughs> Can you see now? No. Okay. This is mm. in the below menu. There is this uh, opportunity to share screen, and I see <laughs> that at least Rosa has a permission to do so. Yeah, exactly. I, I am, I am, I, I, I clicked on that link and I selected my PowerPoint. Uh -huh. But apparently it is not showing. There's, there's some. Mm -hmm. That is a shame. It was a very exciting PowerPoint <laughs> uh, presentation. <laughs> no, okay. Okay, I, we have to save that. I'm sorry, but it's it says that it's sharing, but it's not showing anything. So, no. And how about uh, sharing your database uh, because you wanted to show something from? Uh, uh, yes, from I will. Monitor. I will send maybe something later on. Okay. Because we don't have a link to what I'm showing here. Okay. Okay, I, I don't understand what is, but I will. No, you're not seeing anything. Please grant browser access. Nothing yet. Nothing. No. Okay. Okay. We must keep the time in mind. So, um, yes. Okay. About five minutes, is that possible? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So, I will continue. Um, the connection between the databases can also be seen in the metadata linked to persons. An example of a good merge of the three databases is a man named Skuli Helgason, born in 1916. Skuli was an informant for a number of legends in, in a collection published by Gwyneth Jonsson in the years 1940 to 1957. Skuli was also an informant in four interviews from 1966, as can be seen on his profile in the new website. What is interesting here is that in two of the interviews, he talks about Sigfus Sigfusson, who was also a protective folklore collector in the early 20th century. And since now we have many connections between persons through different channels, we are currently developing ways of illustrating the connections as networks. For that, we import data about informants and collectors of legends and wonder tales to a graph database, along with informants and interviewers of uh, audio recordings. We also import the data about letters, centers and receivers that was uh, a part of Sagmarinur and was produced during the research project about the collection and publication of Jón Arnarsson's collection, Íslenska Þjóðsugur og Æmyndir. When viewing a profile for a person in the new database, a query is made to the graph database and network data is fetched. The relations are then rendered as an interactive graph where different relations can be highlighted. 
This makes it easy, for example, to see all informants in collector. Any notes from the graph function as links so the user can click on a person to view that person's profile. A similar graph is also produced for musicians to see in which groups they have been members of and other members of those groups. And with this new database, we hope to open up new possibilities for research and dissemination of this material. And in the case of folklore databases, is in, in the isolated context, the one whole system works better than many separate systems. Import, important factor is also to be able to connect with other systems. And Sagnagrunner already has a data provider for, to connect its material to the North Isabel project. And some of the persons in Sagnagrunner have reference to the Encyclopedia of Romantic Nationalism in Europe. So we hope that this new unified database will open up more connections to a larger context. And I'm very sorry that you didn't see my, my slides. They were really, really impressive. I can, yeah. I can promise you. <laughs> it must be really impressive. Yeah, it's, it's a pity we couldn't see them. Um, yeah, it's, thanks, uh, thanks for, uh, for your contribution. Is there, are there any questions or remarks? for Trousty or Rosa. Will you be having any uh, ethical question, uh, ethical problems with your databases? Are there any uh, offensive um, stories or songs in the databases? <coughs> yeah, in the, in the sound recordings we have yeah, sensible material, you could say. And uh, most of the recordings are from that time before people were had to, to uh, uh, sign a, con a content or, or... Yeah, yeah, a so, contract, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so consent, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, uh, but we... <laughs> We use the, the rule that if people say something in the recording that, that uh, leads us to, to the thought that, oh, he, didn't want, he, he or she didn't want anyone to hear that, then we just close it up. You, I, I make an, an abstract, not telling really about the sensible material, sensitive materials, sorry, and, and then... Uh, and I give it keywords so people can find it, but you cannot listen to the recording. Okay. So instead of <coughs> instead of a player, you get a, a notice saying that the informant has uh, put restrictions on this material, but you can contact the institute. And then I just look at the the request and and see what is it is it necessary for this person to to listen to that and and make a decision every time okay well thank you very much um we've reached uh, 11 o'clock here at uh, central europe uh, european time um and uh, in a few minutes i must run off to a poster presentation so uh, i must round up uh, this uh, session and thanking uh, of course all the the the, the uh, wonderful contributors uh, sonia rita nicholas rosa and trousty and um there is an afternoon session beginning at uh, one o'clock uh, central european time again with three presentations and uh, there is room for more discussion than uh, in the afternoon because I saw uh, in the chat that there were more issues to be, uh, to be discussed and uh, there is this opportunity in the afternoon. We start at one o'clock uh, 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 Central European time. So once again, thank you all. Thank you all for visiting and participating and uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, uh, I'm rounding up. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Thank you. for me as Bye -bye. well. And